that's still leading the nation and the world through a time of tremendous political change and uplift, at least sometimes uplift. And I do want to focus my eyes, and I hope yours too, on things that lie ahead of us. But at these kinds of celebratory moments, it's hard not to want also to look back. For my own backward look, I draw justification from the thought that trends have a built-in chronology to them. To define a trend, data points that are yet to come have to be extrapolated from ones that have already gone by. So it's all right to be a bit reminiscing, a bit reflecting, maybe even a little bit sentimental. I think I went to my first ever 4S meeting in Pittsburgh in 1986, 10 years after the founding. Before I was born in Ithaca and I joined Cornell University only two years after that landmark date, I didn't actually begin thinking about the society as a part of my life until I was elected to the council in 1989. I'm not sure I was even a dues-paying 4S member at the time. Now that may speak more to my own professional fecklessness than to the way the society was run back then. In any case, you can be sure that times have changed. I don't think I've skipped more than two forest meetings in the intervening years, and I've always gone as a fully paid up member. Wes wouldn't let me get away with doing any other thing. And in the era of internet policing, we don't have the luxury anymore of indulging our ambivalence about a group by holding office in organizations to which we haven't yet officially committed our belonging. But there's a serious point to that story, and it's about my identity, the identity of our field, the identity of this society, and what gives me any standing to speak to its trends and futures. As I look out over this crowded room with so many friends and colleagues looking back at me, I believe that we've come a long, long way in carving out an intellectual territory. That field now stands ready to take on new challenges with a whole new generation of eager scholars peopling it, this year, the last of what I call the long 20th century, is a good time for us all to look ahead. But prediction can be risky business. Many of us in this room have spent a good part of our scholarly lives demonstrating the self-evidence of that truth. So here's a little story about prediction that you may want to carry away from this evening. I took it from the website of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts because it's about a painting that appeals to me greatly. And I quote, a little more than 100 years ago, Paul Gauguin began, where did we come from? What are we? Where are we going? The artist called it his testament because he planned to take his own life when the painting was finished. He worked feverishly, painting, as he said, on sackcloth full of knots and wrinkles, but found the finished work more than, more than acceptable, writing and this is a quote from Gauguin. I believe that this canvas not only surpasses all my preceding ones, but that I shall never do anything better or even like it. So Gauguin survived the completion of this work for five more years, and his testament became one of the most important paintings of the 19th century. So when we in STS ask, where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? We may want to keep Gauguin in mind. The making of a space may not fully determine what kind of space it is. We may not be the best judges of our own efforts and trajectories. With the energy and talent so palpably present before this panel, the future may be more glorious than any of us can currently imagine. But there are still things we need to do, potential problems we should heed, and promises we must make and keep. I'll speak of a couple of these challenges. The first is solidarity. The term is perhaps more familiar to our colleagues from other continents and even from north of the border, but it's a term that should hold special meaning for us in STS. For we are a field that doesn't believe in knowledge located outside of bodies, places, and cultures. Judy has already spoken about this. But going further, we think that making knowledge is about the making of collectives, it's about drawing and holding things and people together. So it is, so it has been, and so it ought to be. I am where I am today because a former president of this society, Dorothy Nelkin, took me under her capacious wing when I was a beginning academic without voice or field in remote upstate New York in 1978. 
I am where I am today because in 1983, I think, an unknown young man, unknown to me, who has since become known to you all as Mr. Boundaries, Tom Gearin, came up to me from an audience at a AAAS annual meeting and said, you know, your talk was wonderful sociology of science. You should submit it to social studies of science. I'd never heard of the journal, of course. Uh, I am where I am today because the then editor of 3S, our dear friend and colleague David Edge, taught me how to write for an interdisciplinary audience and to overcome the continuous professional identity crisis I had found myself in through much of the, 19, the decade of the 1980s. I am where I am because Karen, one of our most distinguished scholars, trailblazed the role of activist for as president at the 1996 Bielefeld meeting, which then became an example for many subsequent ones. I am where I am today because of the friendship and support of endless colleagues and students throughout the years who have helped shore up my faith that the work we put into intellectual solidarity is ultimately the only work worth doing. But why do I stress this theme at this meeting? It is, by the look of things, one of the best meetings we've had. It's well run, well attended, exciting, varied, so much so that we almost forget the soulless urban landscape that we find ourselves in. <laughs> But our very successes seem to me to risk leading us into complacency, into thinking that we have reached the promised land. All that remains now is to sit back and rest on our laurels that we have become, as one colleague recently put it, exporters of our wares to other users, including other disciplines. I don't think, personally, that we can afford such complacency. The danger I see is twofold. First, by taking STS for granted, we risk reifying the field at a stage of development that is far from complete. Indeed, completion is what one should never hope for from a field that's worth pursuing. So I don't think it's just because science and technology will be with us 10,000 or however many years hence, um, but because what that field is all about is still up for grabs in some important sense. Any other stance may even lead some to become nihilistic, to treat STS as a blip on a radar screen rather than a trend, to declare that our tools and methods are passé, left behind in the dust, and we should move on to new challenges and new crises. Climate change, it's been said, has stilled the voice of critique and skepticism. It's time to drop STS, get real, and maybe turn our hands to political theory and even public policy. Well, that's not my position. I think we have a larger duty. I think our role is to function as critics of the blind spots in modernity, high, late, post, vanilla, or any other flavor you choose to take it in. To everything, there is a season. But if I'm a foreteller of any merit, then for STS, the time of withering lies far in the distance. The second reason not to be complacent takes us back to solidarity. For we have not yet built the infrastructures that will ensure stable lives and careers in STS for the next generation. In this country, Cornell remains the only STS department at an Ivy League university. It doesn't have to be a department, but other infrastructures are also not there. Though the field is clearly growing and thriving at many levels, it's still the case that we have to explain our students in others' terms. We still have to say almost all the time why they would be a good fit for jobs in environmental studies, sustainability science, women's studies, history of science, let alone anthropology or sociology. We cannot yet simply say, this is the most interesting STS scholar I have ever trained, hire him or her simply on that basis. Too much of the time, we're still forced to camouflage ourselves, to travel the world in borrowed disciplinary clothes. My own students tell me with knowing smiles that they've learned to predict when I will say the telltale words, I am a lawyer by training. <laughs> Last year, Steve Wolgar spoke in this panel about his experiences going through airport security with suspicious looking liquids and bottles. One of my dreams is that someday a border security officer will ask me what I profess, as they routinely do, and I will say, STS. <laughs> Finally, let me say a word about constructivism and critique. 
At this meeting, I've been struck by the eagerness, almost impatience, that many of my younger colleagues seem to feel about selling their intellectual wares in wider markets than our own home meetings. There is, more specifically, a great urge to bring STS to policy to make sure that our words and our perspectives are heard and heeded by those in power. Well, let the voice of experience speak here a little cautiously. First, learn to be patient. If you have things to say, the world will listen and they will beat a path to your door, maybe when you are least looking for it. The internet era has deprived us all of privacy, but it has also made sales pitches easier. You're out there as soon as you write something. If the words have meaning, they will also have weight. Sit back, relax. The world of ideas is still a seller's market. Don't think you have to buy in too quickly. The problem with buying into policy in particular is that it comes with baggage that we in this field above all should not take on board without sniffing it out with our most alert instincts. That baggage is political, ideological, deeply cultural, and potentially very, very counterproductive. What makes this field unique is that we have learned often the hard way that we black box things at our own peril, even on the night before Halloween. So my closing advice to the, our field tonight, or at least the representatives who are here, is to continue to be critical, continue to be constructivist to the hilt, have the courage of your convictions, and never be afraid to be ornery. Thank you. Now, we have a microphone to be passed around someplace. Is, is it only that one? Only this one. OK, so we'll keep this up here. OK, so when you ask a question, shout at the top of your lungs. Okay. Jeff. Hi, Jeff University of Pittsburgh. Um, I thought that was a wonderful set of presentations, but as with many others in the room, I was building up my own laundry list as I went along and what wasn't being talked about. And I just want to mention a couple of trends that I think are just great in the field right now and I'd like to hear from the panel. Um, one is what's called e-science in Europe or um, cyber infrastructure in America, where there is incredible engagement between the design community and the working scientists. And I think that's a new direction in science studies, which is very promising. And I was delighted to be at a dinner last night with uh, 12 people working in, in the field of values and design, value-centered design. I think that's a great growth area. Second thing that wasn't mentioned, which I think is a growth area, is the study of what's called indigenous knowledge, better known as other ways of knowing, and since we all know all, all knowledge is local. I think there's some great new work coming out there, and I really encourage that trend. Um, and finally, something that um, used to be in the future of um, our field and sort of dropped away a little bit despite the quantitative answer of, of Judy. Uh, look, I've talked about this in the past, that science metrics used to be much better integrated into our field uh, and better represented at this conference. And I would love to see us actually working together with the science patricians again and not creating this false false quantified. Okay, this is a good comment. Does anybody want to respond? No? Okay. <laughs> um, next question. Well, the only thing, I, I mean, just as you do need to expand on this, and I think Wes and I were actually talking about, weren't we at council or something, the fact that we had been meaning to, to engage more um, our skills in critiquing all these evaluation exercises and and trying to elicit some more articles maybe in techno science and other um, uh, places like that, you know, just kind of use our expertise and keep those people in there because they're the best critics of this kind of thing. So yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, the, the one thing that we've been discussing in meetings is the uh, ISI ranking of journals and we're in a paradoxical situation in STHD and uh, 3S, and both are ranked rather high in our fields, but we know that those, uh, the, the, those numbers are generated in a way that's highly dubious, and so what we want to sponsor is studies that will show that we don't rank as high. <laughs> Thank you.
Ari. I'd like to... Uh, this is Ari. Maybe we should give names. Ari Rip, for those who... Few people in the room don't know who that is. <laughs> I'd like to, uh, to continue some of the final remarks of Sheila, in a sense criticize them, but in another sense continuing, because I think when we're talking about your advice to younger colleagues who are eager to sell their wares on other markets and engage in policy, you actually stopped too soon, because what you said, I think, has value. <coughs> But what is happening now is that it's not just younger colleagues and older colleagues sort of trying to engage in other areas and other markets. It's also that it is, as you were referring to already, uh, we are sometimes being invited. Not in all places, but in a number of places in some policy making and policy advising situations with the European Union, for example with scientists and technologies in new emerging areas with this whole issue of environment and, and global change. And so there, I think it is very important to realize that you are in a very ambivalent position. You have to be there and you have to sort of do this uphill struggle that you were in a sense referring to. On the other hand, it's also indicative of something about science and society and our possible roles that this is happening. So it's, in a sense, a challenge for uh, research and reflection itself. What is happening in society is that we are being invited. We don't have an easy period, but we can be there. And I think so, my advice to your colleagues would be to take your advice in mind, but still go on and sell <coughs> Well, I mean, sometimes you add in a very reflexive way. I couldn't disagree with anything that you put before, right? Um, the, the danger of having all these sudden things is that one somehow miraculously tends to have lots of reflexive instincts stripped away from oneself. Many years ago, my husband and I coined Chasmoff's Law. It was about advertising. The very trait that a product advertises is the trait you should watch out for and the basis on which you should not buy. <laughs> this is a sort of counter evidence on problem of reflexivity. The reason that we point this law is that we bought a thing called a non collapsible bathtub for our first day. <laughs> I will say no more. <laughs> into all those spaces and of course if you're invited or more you're invited to the life that you should go. The point I'm making is being reflected as you suggest by what it is you're taking, why it is you're being invited there. And I have profound skepticism about both the we and the SES that's being invited. So it's not all of it, it's some of it, it's not all places, it's some places. And you know I think as long as we those kinds of things in life will be fine. Yes. Again, loud. Yes! <laughs> uh, this is an invitation of sorts, and it starts with a remarkable fact that in our country, in this country, and in all of the countries where we all come from, every day, or every weekday at least, there are groups of people gathering together to talk about what science is and to learn often from very odd and dubious examples about what science is. And there are millions of these peoples, and there are thousands of these groups, hundreds of thousands of them. And they have enormous influence on what it is that science becomes and will become in our society, in all of our societies. They're called classrooms. And we're studying them almost not at all. And that's a remarkable now, education as a field is not as sexy a thing to study, not as prestigious a thing to study as biotechnology or nanotechnology or e-science or any of those things. It's a low prestige field. It has been for many years for complicated social reasons. But the impact of it and the intellectual interest of what goes on there, I think is remarkable. And I think we should pay more attention to it. I think it should be on this list. Also, by education, if you mean K-12 only, then maybe that's also not quite broad enough agenda. 
because my mind wants to study elite formation in all kinds of places. Um, so I think that there's a boundary issue here about who actually is doing that study and who not. I think some of the um, most experienced SCS people I've like known have been themselves in education schools and doing education policy. So they have participant observers in a sense who are both studying and trying to affect the kinds of things they're doing. So while we may be right, I think, I mean, while we may be right in the sense that, you know, we could ask like over the last couple of years, or the last five years, how many articles on education have appeared in 3S. I'm not sure that that's the only measure about which we should be looking at the connections between SES and education very broadly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but I disagree with your comment. I think uh, there, there is work on education. There are programs on science education, though I think they could be better informed by SCS. But uh, uh, there, there is some work around that uh, perhaps you don't know about, or perhaps you don't agree with that is informed by SCS. So, but. Oh, oh. You're Mr. Boundaries. Oh, oh. Following Chuck's lead, uh, I spent the day with about 20 other people in the same room talking about space, place, and science. And if I can add that to the list of emerging topics, uh, it's been a wonderful confluence of people from design professions, architects, planners, um, and geographers coming together. And we're all looking at each other, not yet sure of what this is going to become, but all fairly enthusiastic that it will become something worth doing. Uh, and it made me think that we need to ask what was accomplished when Karen put up a picture of a building, beautiful as it might have been, and located it for us in California and Silicon Valley. I think if we say it was more than just a throwaway, then we can begin to see why studies of space, place, and science, science might be interesting. And in actually for extensive rationalization, but, <laughs> but it's just that I like California. <laughs>
there is, I, I come from an interesting background, and, and there is an advantage in that when there are a lot of um, sort of not easily compartmentalized positions, and um, I think students who have that kind of background can adapt, even if they are not SCS in some combination of those letters and words. So, um, yeah, keep hope, and uh, let's hope that uh, there will be uh, positions because. Look around here, there are a lot of younger people here. Um, most of the submissions I get with social studies and science are from recent PhDs or graduate students. And uh, I think of it as like a population pyramid of a developing nation. You know, where, where all the people are young, a few at the top, uh, the older age brackets. And, uh, this field looks a lot like that. So, Larry, push. Um, I, I guess I wanted to add to the to the list that several other people have it here. Um, I, although I didn't organize the session, I spent a couple of hours this afternoon in a session on neoliberalism. I guess there's another one tomorrow. And, and I wanted to suggest that one of the things about STS is that it started, of course, uh, with a fascination with physics. Uh, we all knew that physics was the, the very model of a modern major discipline. <laughs> and, and the uh, it's gradually expanded and, and uh, colonized, if you wish, other areas. Uh, I would argue that, uh, that doing some much more serious work on neoliberalism and related fields uh, is probably something that we ought to be giving tremendous consideration to. Yeah, it's, uh, I think St. John's to say something about the uh, multiplication of items on the list. Uh, because obviously you could do that forever, and you know, where if you take as your uh, domain the, the social and political study of knowledge making, then that leads you everywhere. But I think you're making a slightly different point because uh, studying neoliberalism in SCS is not the same as studying indigenous knowledge or infrastructures, right? I mean, you're saying that. that uh, studies devoted, I mean, where the object is a political formation. Uh, might be disordered in productive directions. And I think that that speaks to the definition of the field and you know, why it's not, say, the same as sociology of science in a sense. Uh, because then, you know, you're, you're calling attention to the fact that it's not just the objects in the making, the scientific and technological systems, but also the, the surrounding social constraints within which those things develop. And of course, you, as you will not be surprised to know, you have a very strong ally of at least one member of the power in that view. Yeah, I don't think there's, um, well, certainly neoliberalism is not um, limited to an SS topic. And so, what are we hoping? The many studies that are starting to address that particular phrase, um, that uh, there would be a, a critical examination of what that could possibly mean in detail. And uh, rather than adopt it from some sort of uh, imported theoretical apparatus and, um, and then uh, make it more complicated, which is easy to do because it has to be more complicated when you look at it. Okay, we're going to, as I promised, uh, we're going to end a little bit early so people can put on their costumes or whatever. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, why don't we take a couple more questions and, and then um, uh, we will relax it. Please do go for the um, uh, Martina? Yes. Martina Mertz, I would like to add something to the list, but in a slightly different way. The attention to science dynamics and the cycleness of science dynamics when we consider our own field. We've been sort of mapping the development of how nanoscience and nanotechnology has developed over the last year, but why don't we do that with our field as well? And I have heard some of it on the podium, but I think it would be interesting to consider also why and how and where uh, science STS has been growing and where it has not. And I think one interesting feature is that there has been an enormous increase in the regions of different Asian countries and also a lot of activities Latin America, but what is also surprising is that while a lot of scientific facts, fields are taken up in continental Europe from Anglo-Saxon countries, this is not necessarily the case with STS. So we have certain national university systems which have also shown to be remarkably resistant to STS, and I think that 
something interesting to consider also uh, in a more analytical mode of what we might be studying and dealing with. Well, uh, I remember years ago you go from Sharpie did it who was in the audience did a study of the relationship of SDS to science policy in a number of different countries. So again, there are little patches, but it was interesting to me that it took a Japanese scholar to be asking your question. Uh, for thinking about the future of SDS, please don't forget uh, outside other American society. And I'm from Tokyo, and uh, in East Asia and in other regions, SDS is uh, developing very rapidly. And I'd like cordially invite all of you to come to the Tokyo meeting. <laughs> I think that's a really fine closing note. <laughs> Thank you very much.